OK. Welcome back, everybody. Um, hope you had a chance to, uh, to get a cup of tea and just relax for a bit. Um, so now we're going to continue with this just before we, we start. Um, could I just encourage um, delegates to uh, to start to think about personal pleasures and how, how they are going to um, change the way they work or try and influence the industry in any particular way? What's the initiatives that, that um, each individual can can actually do do on you know, with regard to reducing carbon emissions. Um, so hopefully we'll start to get some through. They can be anonymous or they can be, you know, um, personal. It doesn't matter. Um, but it will encourage everyone to, to follow suit once once they start coming through. So now I'm going to introduce you to Matt Fluke from Anglian Water. Um, Matt uh, is currently sustainability lead, leader for one of the largest pipeline projects in the UK. Um, so hundreds of, uh, of kilometres of new interconnecting pipe work to combat the impact of climate change and safeguard water supplies for the east of England. Um, so with that in mind, I think um, I'll hand over to, to Matt who will start his presentation. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks a lot, Richard. Appreciate that. Hi, everyone. Hope you've had a, a, a good day so far. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, carbon reduction, but uh, trying to do it at a more strategic level. So what I want to do is I want to give you some context um, in terms of climate uh, and the water industry before I go into the particular project uh, that we're working on at Anglian Water through the Strategic Pipelines Alliance. If we have the first uh, slide, which is I think it's just introducing me, that's me. Let's get on to the next one which is uh, you can flick over the next one. Uh, so that's here, here we go with some context because it's vital we get the context of what I'm talking about, I think. So if we just go to the next slide, just two slides on the climate context. Hopefully you all know this. I'm sure you all know this, but uh, let's just be clear that what we are pitching for in terms of trying to respond to the climate emergency. We're trying to keep temperatures uh, below two degrees, if not below one and a half degrees. We're not on track for that. We've seen one degree of war warming. We're more like on track for about three and a bit uh, degrees of warming by 2100. Um, so we aren't in the right place when it comes to reducing uh, carbon globally. Um, because as that last bullet point says that we can't afford to emit any more carbon beyond 2050. We need to be net zero. That's why uh, everyone is uh, is committing to it. Stating the obvious but really important obvious point. So next slide if I may. OK, so that's the global perspective. What about the uh, the national perspective? So uh, you'll know that um, the uh, the official body who are keeping us honest and keeping the government honest when it comes to responding to uh, climate change. That's the, the Climate Change Committee and they are through that uh, Climate Change Act that was mentioned earlier. They have been made responsible for uh, setting carbon budgets and making sure we're on track with those carbon budgets, driving the carbon reduction down to what the government is now committed to net zero by 2050. But they're also responsible for making sure that we adapt to the changes unfortunately that are already locked in and that we are already seeing and we'll continue to see and I think we'll continue to see at an accelerating rate. Um, so they've got this both sides of, of the climate coin which are there they are there to uh, to help us manage. So this august body the climate change committee what do they say about how we're doing in the UK in terms of a reducing carbon mitigation and b adapting to the changing climate that we're seeing in this country never mind the, um, the the significant changes we're seeing elsewhere. Well, as that slide states, guess what? We're not on track at the moment in terms of reducing carbon, even though we are leaders in this area in terms of setting a net zero strategy as, as a country and making that legal commitment. And as they say, we're not even on um, on track for to be prepared for a two degrees rise, let alone this higher um, uh, temperature rise that we're on track for at the moment. So, um, yeah, there is a problem, OK, and we need to respond to it both in terms of reducing carbon and being prepared for those changes. So that's the 
the climate context, which I think is so, so important as I talk about what I'm going to talk about. Let's move on to one more bit of context um, on the next slide, if we may, uh, which is uh, the water sector itself. So uh, within that climate context, what's, where is the water uh, sector at with regard to uh, mitigation, adaptation, carbon reduction and, um, uh, and, and, and resilience? So let's have the, the first slide. So this one talks about uh, the risks that we are, are facing at the moment in the water sector. Um, the two big risks are flooding, whether that's flooding be from our uh, sewers or flooding of our sites and assets, our water treatment works, our pumping stations, our sewage treatment works, etc. So we are at risk of flooding. That was made very real over Christmas um, to a number of us. I'm sure you would have known people who were affected by flooding. I helped move a friend out of a house who was flooded by overloaded sewers. Um, and you know that is in, it, it appears to be increasing in, in, in frequency. So that that's um, the, the one side of the risk in the water industry, and it also sits on the UK's climate just climate uh, risk register as one of the highest risks as well. So as well as too much water, we've got the problem of too little water. Um, so drought, uh, for example. So what that graph uh, there is from? It's it's a, a little graph from Anglian Water's Water Resources Management Plan, which shows the at the moment the um, surplus of water that we have in our region in terms of the demand compared to the supply fine we're great but when we forecast that forward to 2045 and we see the reductions in that supply demand balance because of the growth when we see the reductions due to having to keep water in the environment so we have to um, we, we can't abstract as much as we like the sustainability reductions uh, that eats into that um, and when we need to put in a little bit of a, a headroom and, and, and deal with severe droughts, that also eats into it. But there's a massive chunk, 58 uh, MLD, which is taken out because of the changing climate. So the changing climate is, 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 is also affecting that supply demand balance. So um, we have to do something about that. So the, the project I'll talk about in a second speaks to that second climate risk drought uh, in terms of um, laying these mains. So. That, next slide, please. So that's um, I've got three three slides on, on on context in the water industry. This is, in fact, I think I've got four. <laughs> this is the next one. Um, so I'm I'm delighted to be part of a an industry, not just an organisation, which is taking this seriously and it is committed to achieve net zero carbon, not by 2050, but by 2030. So that wasn't set because we think we can do it. It's set because we need to do it. That's that's the angle that we've come at this particular target as a water industry. And so it's a huge challenge to do and we can't do it alone. We're going to need so much help uh, to do it. But obviously to get to net zero, what it means is balancing out uh, the greenhouse gas emissions that no doubt we will still be emitting in 2030 uh, with netting off any of those residuals, residual emissions uh, as well. So that's the balance we've got to try and get to. It's going to be helped, fantastic, by in emerging technologies and innovation, great. But we also need to recognise that there's probably things going to come in uh, into scope which can make striking that balance harder. At the moment, capital carbon or embodied carbon, for example, a scope three emission sits sits outside. So um, we've got to uh, manage that. So, but that's what the whole water industry in England and Wales has committed to: net zero carbon in in 2030, or England is committed to net zero carbon by 2030. So. We launched that, I think, just before lockdown, uh, and we've all been developing roadmaps towards that. Next slide, please. So, um, let's see, what should I bring out on this? So this is um, really where we're coming from as we set that, uh, that net zero strategy. So uh, what, what to look at is, um, the bar chart, which just goes down and down and down in terms of the tons of CO2 that the water industry is emitting. Isn't that fantastic? So it's going down. Just draw a straight line. We'll get to net zero. No problem. No, um, because we've got growth. Um, no, because a lot of those reductions have come from decarbonisation of the grid. Um, we've still got some really tricky um, carbon emissions to to, to, to get at. So, for example, these emissions we call process emissions. So those are 
the uh, carbon emissions associated with what just comes off our treatment works, primarily our sewage treatment works or water recycling centres as we call them, just the methane and nitrous oxides that come off, uh, but also we have some coming off our water treatment works uh, as, as well, particularly uh, ozonation. So we've got some some way to go, even though that, that looks positive and you can see there's some netting off going on um, by purchasing uh, green electricity um, as well as generating and exporting some, some renewable electricity as well. OK, so that's where we've come from um, and what we're going to have to influence to get down to net zero. So how are we going to do it? One simple slide which is coming up now, please. So there's a a, a very simple slide to say how we're going to get down to net zero. Three, you know, areas. Firstly, let's just reduce the greenhouse gases as much as as we can. Let's uh, become even more energy efficient. Uh, for example, mm -hmm. uh, let's continue to grow renewables. So uh, at Anglian Water, we um, have got most of our renewables cu currently comes from uh, sewage gas from um, uh, burning that in uh, combined heat and power engines. Uh, but we've also got some wind turbines uh, and we've got an increasing scale of solar. So we're really backing that hard. So if you know our region, if you know Grafham Water, uh, our, one of our biggest uh, reservoirs, we've uh, put solar around that so that the biggest water treatment works, the biggest carbon footprint in Anglian Water is, is running off uh, solar power on a day like this. It will be actually exporting to the grid as well. So um, renewables are seen as one of the most important things we can do to get towards that, that net zero. But we recognise uh, by 2030 there's going to be some uh, insetting or offsetting uh, required. So, um, you know, for example, we are, are, are talking to landowners to see how we can uh, create carbon offsets within the region. So we not only just get uh, carbon offsets, but we also develop uh, green offs, um, uh, biodiversity net gain, for example, or, or offsets as well. So simple diagram saying how we're going to get down to uh, net zero. Huge, huge task to do it and we can't do it alone. Um, if you want more information on that, just go onto the web, uh, look on the Water UK website uh, and there are two uh, detailed documents. Well, one detailed document showing uh, the roadmap uh, to get to 2030 and there's also a, a summary document as well. And as I say, individual water companies are working up there, excuse me, industry specific uh, roadmaps uh, as, as well. OK, so let's have the next slide. So um, this having set that context, let me talk about the particular project that I'm working on at, at the moment. So I have a, I have a history in, in leading the development of um, energy, carbon and climate change strategy for, for Anglian water, um, but I've, uh, I've moved across uh, to to be able to support with delivering some of that strategy uh, around reducing carbon on um, one of uh, well it's the biggest scheme that I've been involved in in my working life and it's you know it's one of the biggest infrastructure schemes going on in the UK uh, today so uh, let's have the next slide which just explains a little bit about that strategic pipeline uh, as we call it so First of all, what is it? Think back to that graph that I showed you where it shows that in terms of a su supply demand balance uh, today, we've got enough supply to be able to meet the demand. But looking forward to 2045, not only do we run out, we go into deficit. So one of the things we need to do, and it's a twin track strategy. In fact, I need to say before I tell you what we're doing to create supply is actually we are reducing demand as well. So through leakage, through metering, through working with customers to influence behaviours, we're trying to take that demand down as low as possible, the no build option if we can. But recognising we can't do it just through demand management, we also have to deal with the supply side of the equation. That's what this uh, is, is, is the most important thing that we are doing in this next five years. When you look at where our surplus of water is at the moment, it's uh, sitting in the north uh, of our of our region. So um, and we've got uh, deficits down in the southeast near near Colchester, which is uh, one of the driest, hottest parts of uh, of the UK. And so uh, we're having to shift uh, that surplus 
uh, around down from the north to the south. So uh, it's not quite 500 kilometers of, of, of new pipeline that we're laying. When we first looked at it, it looked like it'd be about 500 kilometers, but um, through you know subsequent design, it's going to be less than that to be able to interconnect the existing network. But it's it's uh, not it's not much short of 500 kilometers of, of, of pipeline. It's quite a large diameter pipeline. That spine from Elstrom down to Ipswich uh, varies between 560 mil and 800 mil main. Um, the default, well, you know, the default was either uh, uh, metallic or, or plastic main was the baseline that we were working to. I'll tell you a bit more about that in a second. Uh, sitting off to the side of that main spine, there are some schemes also just to um, bring some resilience, bring some additional water into uh, other parts of our region. So you can see the Norwich to Wyndham area. So that's um, uh, 350 ish million pounds worth of scheme delivered by uh, five partners in the Strategic Pipeline Alliance, Alliance, one of which is the client, if you like, Anglian Water. Uh, but then we've got excellent um, other partners to, to help us, Farron's, Costain's, Jacobs and MMB. So um, we're working through an alliance because that's a proven approach that we've used in Anglian Water to deliver uh, much of our uh, capital programme uh, in, in the past. So that's what the scheme the scheme is that we we are delivering. Uh, let's move to the next slide to just talk about that scheme in carbon terms, if if we may. So here we go. This is the um, carbon targets that uh, Anglian Water has set upon uh, it, it, the strategic pipelines allowance alliance. So we they want to see a 27% reduction in operational carbon versus a 2020 baseline. So when, these, when the scheme was designed, the baseline was set at 2020. So we need to deliver by 2025 a 27% reduction on that. Um, and I think more challengingly, well, much more challenging is the capital carbon target is versus a 2010 baseline. We've got to take 65% uh, of the carbon out of um, the solution that we're, we're delivering. Now that is, that's massive. If you look at what Anglian Water delivered uh, in the last five year period. It delivered a, a something like a 61, I think it was, percent uh, reduction over the five years. Largely that came from non-infrastructure above ground, ground schemes. Delivering that level of carbon reduction on a pipeline scheme is massive. It's, it's very, very challenging. Um, so I'm now on the other side of the fence, having set helped set the targets now having to deliver against them. So I think that's only fair, isn't it? Um, how we, what do we, we're very at the early stages of it. Um, we're still in uh, design. We have broken ground, but not actually laid any mains yet. So if I were to sort of forecast ahead and see where we might end up, it's early days, as I say, yes, we, I think we'll easily hit actually that 27% operational carbon reduction. I think that'll be uh, pretty straightforward. Capital carbon, I can't see the 65% at the moment. Um, I can see 55% at least, um, and I'm developing a roadmap to get to, to, to that 65% because I think it might just be possible with help from uh, the supply chain. So if you just click again, I think we stay on the slide just to try and illustrate the scale of what it means to get to from 55% reduction to a 65% reduction. If you think we're laying um, let's say uh, 400, 400 odd kilometers of main between 400 and 500 kilometers of main to actually go from 55% reduction to 65% reduction means we've got to take it's equivalent to taking out another 55 kilometers of main. So can we reduce what we were going to lay by another 55 kilometers if that's all in the biggest uh, steel pipe uh, that we're laying or 175 kilometers if it's uh, a PE pipe. So it's no small thing to try and get from where we can see at the moment to that 65 percent so that's going to keep me busy so let's move on to the next slide so in, the, in these next few slides i want to first of all talk talk about the operational carbon um, what we're doing in terms of operational carbon to to hit the targets on the strategic pipeline and then i'll talk about the capital uh, carbon what we're doing to get down there so um, I've mentioned the, the net zero roadmap already. There's an image of it taken from, from the, web, the web. As I said, it only applies to operational carbon uh, at the moment. Um, so uh, the first thing I've done is to look at where I think we might get on reducing operational carbon and seeing would it be possible 
to pot even get the scheme to be um, net zero on operational carbon. Um, so when I try and understand what that amount of carbon looks like, I put it into energy terms, which means a bit more to me than tons of carbon, if I'm honest. Um, and I equate that to some of the renewable schemes projects that we've got in, in, Anglian, in Anglian water. So there's graph, a picture of graph and water, the solar panels at graph and water, which is one of the biggest solar arrays in, in the water industry. And that's about that's about 11 gigawatt hours of electricity per, per annum. So we'd have to um, deliver another grapham uh, to be able to get to net zero um, or and you you know how challenging it is to deliver onshore wind at the moment. It's all offshore. Uh, we'd have to deliver uh, another three wind turbines to, to, to get there. So um, how feasible that is not. Not really sure. So, um, but our response is to say to the Anglian Waters renewable teams, work with us. Um, let's see what we can do to um, put uh, solar at least um, adjacent to all of the, the pumping stations that we are, are building uh, along the route. So that's the that's the operational carbon challenge. Perhaps we should uh, flick over to the next slide now and think about uh, the capital carbon challenge. So I'm taking it for granted that. Everyone knows that when we talk about operational carbon, that's primarily the energy use, the day to day energy use. So in, in SPA, it's the it's it's the energy that the pumping stations use. The capital carbon is obviously associated with the assets that we we construct. Some people call it embodied or in, embedded, um, but let's call it capital carbon for now. So what's this slide showing you? Um, well, Let's just look at the graph perhaps first on, on the left hand side. What I've extracted there is um, when looking at a laying a pipeline, uh, where what where where is most of the capital carbon associated uh, with laying a pipeline? And that's what that um, graph shows. So no surprise that the vast majority of the carbon capital carbon is locked up in the pipe material. Uh, that uh, you're laying. So, uh, you know, the, the length you're laying, the diameter you're laying, the wall thickness you're laying uh, will all influence that. Um, there's not an insignificant amount also in um, the construction in terms of backfill, backfill reinstatement and ex excavation. Um, and then uh, there are other smaller amounts which aren't trivial. Um, they are things that we uh, have influenced in the past. We will influence on this scheme as as well. But at this early stage of design, uh, you can imagine the whole focus is on uh, on trying to uh, lay as little uh, pipeline as possible in the lowest material uh, with with the lowest thinnest pipe pipe wall. So that's that gives you a sense of what we've got to get at when reducing capital carbon in a pipeline scheme. The first few bullet points on that slide. Um, are, are there to give you uh, a sense of scale of this uh, the strategic pipeline that we're laying. So if you compare the, the capital carbon locked up in the baseline of this scheme, it is bigger than the whole all the, the schemes that Anglian Water delivered in the last five year period. So um, it's 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 a big deal for us. And the uh, the individual projects within this pipeline scheme form uh, the majority of the, uh, the the biggest carbon footprint schemes that we're delivering in this five year year period. So a significant scale of of capital carbon to 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 go at. So how are we going to attack that? Next slide, please. So this uh, on one slide very simplistically is 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 the strategy uh, or some key points of the strategy that we have to to reduce the carbon, both operational and capital carbon in strategic uh, in the strategic pipeline. So the first thing to say is, um, you know, Anglian Water uh, is a credit to PAS 2080, which is the standard for uh, reducing carbon and reducing cost uh, in infrastructure projects. Hopefully you're aware of it. If you're not, uh, you need need to be um, because it really is a how to guide on reducing carbon in inf infrastructure projects. It came out of the um, the infrastructure carbon review uh, done with Treasury um, and, and businesses worked together on that. So it's a, it's a brilliant piece of work um, and it just lays out how to reduce carbon and the value that you can drive out in terms of the cost reduction of, of schemes. So um, we're all familiar with the uh, uh, sort of value engineering curve, if you like, on the left hand side, which you know says in terms of if you if you want to take out cost and carbon 
from uh, a, a scheme, you want to do it as early as possible uh, within the scheme. Um, ideally, you want to solve the problem by building nothing. Um, if we built nothing, we would fail as spa, so we're going to need to build something to shift uh, the water. But can we build less? Can we build clever? Can we build efficiently? So that's those are all the things we're looking at. And the the biggest challenge we've had in these early days of uh, SPA Strategic Pipelines Alliance is is to try and challenge the need and the solutions that were handed across to us. So, you know, as I say, Anglian Water set cost and carbon baseline based on certain solutions. Uh, our very first job was to try and challenge that, to have another set of eyes saying, uh, can we challenge that need? Can we challenge that solution? And that's what that picture of the tiger is there meant to represent. We, we created these things we call tiger teams just to we think of tigers being quite disruptive to sort of just challenge everything um, to try and get at that build nothing, build less part of uh, the carbon reduction hierarchy. And so that's been um, quite successful. I'll say more about how successful that's been in a second. Let's move to the next slide. So. Uh, this is a slide just to remind me to tell you that you know all of everything that we do in terms of carbon reduction is informed by carbon models. So basic good practices measure, manage, reduce in terms of carbon. Um, and so you've got to do some measurements. So Anglian Water's got 1400 carbon models uh, which we can use to uh, measure uh, the carbon in pipes in in, in tanks, in pumping stations, and all sorts of assets that Anglia Water uses. So uh, that's the carbon models uh, that we are that we use to set the baseline and then challenge ourselves to 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 beat that baseline. So next slide, please. Um, so we take those um, models and we've plugged them in to um, uh, a relatively sophisticated way of trying to optimize the design. So we're working with optimatics where um, we've we've simulated uh, the uh, the network that we might build and we can and, and develop various scenarios and just run thousands, literally thousands of options uh, using optimatics um, aligned with our hydraulic models to um, try and identify uh, the lowest cost on the left hand side, I think on the left hand side and the lowest carbon yep, on the right hand side. Um, and to to do that optimization, clearly we need to have some penalties and if you like, in terms of how how, how well does the solution actually meet the needs? And so that's up uh, the Y axis. And so what what you're looking through, looking for through driving this uh, optimization approach is um, solutions which sit down in what um, the experts call the knee, the knee of that graph, looking for, for ones which are the lowest cost, lowest carbon uh, with least penalties as well. So uh, there's some fairly sophisticated modeling going on, whole life carbon modeling to try and identify um, uh, the, the best uh, solution in terms of length of pipes, diameter of pipes, material of pipes and pumping stations and tanks as well. So that's the up, up front work that uh, we have been working on and that's the sort of thing that um, the Tiger teams have, have, have challenged as well. Just going to take a drink of water while we move on to the next slide. I'm drying up. Great, thank you very much. So um, this slide is just an output from a, a recent workshop uh, that uh, I was in, involved in. Um, so using that, uh, the modeling that we've done with, with Optimatics, but then also using um, some hand calculations uh, as well and spreadsheets to, to sort of validate and test it. Um, we then come out with um, the least carbon, least carbon, least cost, least carbon options uh, for laying the main. And I can't remember which section this is. This is the section of the main from Peterborough, basically Etton, um, down towards Colchester. Um, and you can see that uh, out pops the theoretical best best options as well as some other options which may be more pragmatic, more practical. Um, and and so that's uh, what we've been doing uh, as uh, as an alliance is uh, challenge ourselves to see uh, how close we can get to the ideal, uh, ideal optimized uh, model of testing the, uh, the 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 ideal optimization as well to come up uh, with a solution which is 
uh, the lowest possible carbon, lowest possible cost solution that we can deliver to meet the need uh, within the time scale. So that's that's all that, that you've got down that down there. One, two, three, four, five uh, different options uh, which we were doing what you might call value engineering on uh, we call uh, risk uh, opportunity and value just looking uh, uh, looking at them so that's what that slide is next slide please so where are we so far as i say it's still early doors in terms of delivering this project albeit we've only got five years so it feels a bit late actually um, and tight on on time this is where we are expressed as as another graph um so what are the three lines that we've got on on here so let's uh, start with the bottom one which says 25 percent below what that this graph compares is the journey we've been on from uh, the baseline that we were set in terms of in that in that bottom case the the installed power of the pumping stations that we um were, were uh, commissioned to to install um and then through challenging the, the design the need and the solution of the design we are sitting at sort of 25 percent below that so um that you know we can still meet the need that's uh, being defined um but uh, we don't need uh, so much pumping station pump, pumping capacity less pumping less cost less carbon so that's what the bottom line is uh, and that keeps moving as we uh, continue our design the next one up the one in the middle blue uh, that's um, the uh, mains length that um, and this is not for the whole 500 kilometer length actually this is for the main spine uh, uh, again we've um, been able to we can see how we've been able to reduce that and meet the needs as well quite significantly uh, and then the top one is actually the diameter the um, average weighted diameter I think it is yeah, the weighted average diameter um, and that's gone up a, a, a bit um, in part um, because we've been clever in, in being able to reuse existing uh, mains, the smaller mains, and, and so that takes them out of the equation. But uh, more significantly, uh, rather late in the day, an additional need came in, additional capacity has needed to be created uh, for a, a separate need that wasn't originally uh, in our scope. So that's uh, led to a slight increase there as well. OK, so that's um, that's virtually me actually but um i do just want to go on to the last slide to emphasize a point which um i can't emphasize enough if you gave me another hour it wouldn't be long enough um to be able to to emphasize this is that you can see that we're delivering this um significant project through collaboration you know bringing uh, the best of designers and constructors together to to try and find the lowest cost lowest carbon solution um but we so desperately need um, the uh, the supply chain to come with us and they have and they are to a certain extent um, but a certain extent is not good enough when you're committed to net zero um, we've we've we need so much more from our um, supply chain from other partners and, and that's what i wanted to emphasize and why i'm so keen to speak to you today because take um, we were talking about steel earlier. Steel pipelines is partly what we're going to be laying for some of the larger diameter mains. Um, think of all that um, carbon embodied cap embodied within the, that steel pipeline. So I, I want to try and get behind that to understand, you know, what could we do to um, have lower carbon steel pipes? So. I need to talk to the suppliers who are based in this country. I need to talk to the fabricators based in, in Turkey, and then I need to get in Spain, I think it is, and then in, and then talk to the, the, the steel manufacturers as well. So I've got suddenly an international supply chain who are may not all be aligned the same way and as committed to net zero uh, as as we are. So um, that just makes things so much difficult when so much more difficult when you've only got a 2030 horizon to get to net zero and a complex supply chain to uh, that you need help from so um that's the point I, I really wanted to make today is that to get to net zero to deliver a project like this we're going to need so much more help from the supply chain thanks a lot okay so <clears throat> thank, thanks matt for that and per perhaps that last slide is, is the inspiration for what for why we're here for the point of this conference really is that it, it's um we all need to collaborate for these initiatives to work um, so I think that's um, that's really what sh sh should hopefully inspire everybody to, to really um, work towards 
doing every, everything possible for for reducing carbon. I was um, I'm just looking at the questions. Um, well, I started one off really with when you when you talked about the capital carbon is the biggest problem, um, obviously, because there's a massive amount of construction work to to construct a pipeline of that length. Um, and I, I'm wondering whether sometimes, you know, less is more, but but also is more or less in as much that if you if you think the Victorians were famous yeah. for designing for over designing pipes, but you know, we're still enjoying the use of them today and whatever they cost in terms of carbon initially is insignificant now because um, I know they leak, but 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 they but they're still there. And, and um, if we if we sort of increase the design horizon rather than reduce it, um, whether that would be an effective way of of offsetting the capital carbon to to a more you know practical level really. And when you think the the planet isn't looking at a five year amp cycle, no. the planet's looking at hundreds and thousands of years of activities. So a bit more now might mean a bit less over the next hundred years. And is that is that a consideration really? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Richard, is that um, I've been involved, as I say, on the other side of the fence with Anglian water in terms of strategic planning. And so our water resources management plan looks 25 years ahead. So these, you know, the planning of investments like this is 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 done with a 25 year horizon. So that is very helpful in terms of making sure we make the best uh, whole life cost decisions. That's I guess that's point one. The second point is then we have regrettably got to manage this through a five year regulatory cycle and that is not always easy. And that's why whenever I talk, I always set that context because if we forget that context, we forget how urgent it is and, and how important it is that we fund the best whole life cost solutions, not just the best five year solution and then think again in five years time. And you've seen Anglian Water and other companies have have been in, let's say, discussion through the Competition Markets Authority to try and make sure that the investment that we want to make is supported by economic regulator with resilience and climate change in mind. So that's uh, the, the, the second point. And then the third, the third point and last point I'd make on, on that, Richard, is when, when I sat in the uh, value engineering workshop, let's call it, uh, last last week. Uh, those exact words were used that you've just said is that let's think about the Victorians because we had one, the Victorian sewers, because we had a solution which was more expensive uh, than um, what we wanted. Um, but uh, we wanted, we, uh, we were challenging ourselves on actually whether that might be the better whole life a cost solution and actually although it delivers more than what we've been asked to deliver it might prevent having to deliver other schemes elsewhere um, uh, to do it so that is a very real challenge that we are wrestling with okay thanks thanks for that um i'm uh, just uh, looking at some of the questions um some, there's someone who's picking up on the on the co2 of the uh, of the steel for the pipe um and really thoughts about that. I, I wondered um, maybe with that question, how it's how we're actually assessing carbon. Are we considering recycling when we consider carbon costs of, of materials and reuse? Would that make steel more attractive? Um, yes, so we, we do. If you look at PAS 2080, which as I say, Anglia Water works to and therefore uh, uh, SPA works to as well as it does uh, allow you to consider the recycling opportunity from uh, the materials. Uh, historically, we haven't actually at uh, Anglian Water. We've stopped at the, um, you know, assuming that once we've laid them, they're there forever um, because, you know, of the uh, length of time that they will be in the ground, these these uh, PE and uh, steel mains. And I see a question. I am just talking PE and steel, and um, I see there's a question relating to whether we looked at other materials. Yes, of course we did. Sorry, I should have said that is that, you know, we we, we did look at uh, other other materials, for example, ductile, ductile iron, whether that would uh, how good that would be in terms of cost and carbon and um, functionality uh, as well. So um, but it does look like we're going to be uh, settling on um, steel and uh, P, at, at least in the majority of cases. Yeah, there's one there about GRE. Um, whether that would have would have offered more savings on on capital cost. 
So I'm I'm going to declare my ignorance there. So it's like glass fibre, isn't it? Um, glass for glass reinforced plastic. Glass uh, it's, it's 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 resin epoxy, isn't it? But glass yeah, well, reinforced epoxy, isn't it, or something? Well, if someone wants to sort of contact yeah. me afterwards and say what I'm missing, yeah. um, I'll be delighted to um, uh, have a look at that. Uh, I know we don't have models for that, so if we need to, and it's an opportunity, if not on this project, on others, we want to take account of it because. As I say, we don't have all the answers. We can't do it yeah. alone. No, I understand that. I, I think um, I think we, we are having a. If anybody wants to take part in a note more open, just it's very difficult with this because we can't see who's asking the questions. But um, if if we did want to carry on any conversations more informally, that would be after after five o'clock. Yeah. yeah. So um, I think I, that's. Oh, wait a minute. Repeatable structures. Oh, epoxy, yeah, it is glass for reinforced epoxy, yeah. That. Yeah. Cool. Um, so for repeatable structures, valves, air valves, hydrant chambers, have you considered off-site manufacturing? Yeah, I haven't majored on those. Mm. Obviously, I've sort of focused on where the biggest mm. carbon is, but um, uh, I don't know how long ago it was now. Was it five to ten years ago? Um, in terms of air valves, for example, uh, it was wonderful to see the change that that happened there through challenging on, on carbon and, and on costs. So we switched from you know, heavy metal air valves, which you know had, had cost attached to them, carbon attached to them, and health and safety implications in terms of installing them attached to them, and uh, and have switched to recycled plastic air valves in some cases. I don't know where we've got to now. So uh, yes, those those smaller um, elements of the pipeline, we have got what we call some standard products. Um, so for those things that we will use time and time again, uh, we've engineered them as as much as we can in terms of cost and carbon. And, and yes, offsite build. Is is one of the key ways that we have reduced carbon and and will continue to reduce mm -hmm. carbon and, and and we're taking a sort of production based mindset and everything that we do because it, as whilst this is a grand project in many ways it's just laying lots of pipe time and time and time again so if you can get the laying of a section of pipe time mm -hmm. and time and time again perfected you, you you get huge savings. Okay, um, I think uh, wait, wait a minute, there are more questions. Net zero in mind. Yeah, about are, are yeah. we open to more expensive solutions? So uh, yeah. I'm glad that someone has picked up that you know we believe and have shown um, where where we drive out carbon, we drive out costs. So we 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 want our cake and we want to eat it uh, as as well. Um, we're working with partners to look at where those. Um, tipping points uh, maybe we're not yet at those tipping points in the vast majority of cases um yeah so no, we, we're still we're still very much in this amp assuming that where we get cost re carbon reduction we get cost uh, reduction as well yeah mold core was that looked at yes it, it has been looked at i've lost again sorry i'm i've lost lost track with that when i was um i know that we were um we had our at one alliance so i sit in the strategic pipelines alliance now but our at one alliance um they championed the way with that and we were were laying that in the last amp period and it did lead to, re to, to reductions in carbon um i know we're taking another look at it at the moment there's been some concerns around it i can't tell you what those concerns are but um there's a little pause uh, at the moment while we just get to grips with get to grips with it okay thanks if, if i could just add one Further, so sort because of, I, I get unfortunately get involved with analysing pipe failures, um, and uh, they are quite common in the industry where um, new pipes are failed in commissioning, and there's nothing more carbon unfriendly than having to reconstruct a pipeline. Um, so I think some degree of redundancy in the design is is wise uh, to account for unforeseen conditions. Yeah, yeah. And not not designing too lean with the with, with the idea of saving cost or saving carbon, but actually ending up having to redo something um, that that's got a lifespan of, of nothing. Um, so yeah. just a, a word on that. But um, other than that, thank thank you very much. That was really really interesting and a fascinating project. It um, is absolutely mm -hmm. massive scale, massive challenges.
and it's yeah. mostly flat as well, isn't it? So you get all the <laughs> issues of, of keeping the air out of the pipe. So it is, um, say, as a yeah. cyclist, I'm enjoying it being flat around here, but uh, yeah, yeah, as a pipeline person, no, not mm. so good. So yeah, thanks, thanks for that, Matt. And uh, I think that's, I think we've answered most of the questions. Cool. So yeah, thanks for.